Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams, and on today's show, I'm going to be speaking with Celeste Vissier. She's also known as Celeste the Therapist, and she's a well known podcast host and author. So I'm excited for today's show, and I want you to keep listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Black Mental Health Health Matters. Matters. I'm Dr. Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. Williams. I'm a psychiatrist practicing here in Massachusetts, and this is a talk show that's about everything related to mental wellness in the Black community. So if you'd like to participate throughout the show, you can give us a call at 617-238-7111. You can also follow along live on Facebook. We'll be streaming on the Facebook page, heat981fm.com. So that's heat981fm.com. Go to that Facebook page, follow along, drop a comment, ask a question. So welcome, welcome, welcome again. And guys, my guest today um, is Celeste Vissier. Um, she's a well-known mental health podcaster. She's also known as Celeste the Therapist. Um, she's a renowned therapist, a mental health advocate, best-selling author, and as I said, podcast host. Um, she's frequently quoted by the media as a mental health expert. She's been in the Washington Post, NBC News, Vice, Healthline, Bustle. She's also appeared on TV One and Fox Soul TV. Celeste has been in the mental health field for almost 20 years, and she believes in the power of living a conscious life. She's dedicated most of her personal life um, and professional endeavors to breaking the stigma surrounding mental and emotional health, especially in communities of color. Um, And there's so much more she's done. We're going to kind of sprinkle that throughout and talk to her a little bit. But Celeste, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here um, to talk to you today. Yeah, so I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, you've been in private practice since 2015 as well. Tell us a little bit about your journey and what's led up to you doing what you're doing now. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester. Shout out to my people. <laughs> uh, and I did not understand mental health at all. Uh, you know, one of the things about America, they tell you, well, growing up, and I, I'm an 80s baby. Uh, go to college. That's the only way you can make money. So I went to college, not sure what I was going to do and uh, needed another job. And I started working at this homeless shelter and um, fell in love with the population. Uh, And people uh, would tell me that, you know, after I would talk to them a little bit, just passing out toiletries, they would always thank me. And I would ask them, why are they thanking me? And they said, thank you for listening. And uh, I found out that you can get paid to talk to people. So I switched my career in uh, school and uh, went the psychology route and I haven't left it. (laughs) So that's why I have all the years of experiences that I kind of fell into this career by mistake. Wow. Wow. And so now you, you speak for organizations around the world. You, um, also, so your podcast is, is it called Celeste the Therapist? Um, and you have a private practice called the Uniting Center. Um, and, you also are an author. So you have uh, a couple of books. One is a journal called 365 Days of Intentional Living. So for those that are looking at the live stream, I'm holding a copy of the book here. Um, and then you also um, have another book called Relationship Goals. Um, you also, you got your master's degree in counseling from UMass in Boston. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And you have a program that you can do uh, like either self-guided or guided. Um, tell us a little bit about that, the, the program you can do either self-guided or guided. Yeah, so one of the things, uh, you know, with the podcast and talking to people on social media, I re- recognize there's not enough uh, therapists, there's not enough clinicians uh, to help people through the journey. Uh, so one of the books that I fell in love with is Healing the Inner Child. And I know for people, just from my own personal experience and just working with people, that that's one of the main areas that people um, don't understand. And uh, when we have not learned about our inner child and how some of the things that may have hurt us growing up can affect us even as an adult. Uh, so I decided I wanted to create this like guided or a self-guided course where people can do it in the comfort of their own home because I understand like, you know, mental health is, can be stigmatizing and, and I want to meet people where they are. And I felt like a nice balance where people can um, purchase the course and uh, work on themselves without having to work up the guts to maybe talk to someone in person or may not be able to have the resources to do that. 
Wow. Yeah. And even, um, you know, the interesting thing is that even people that are looking for therapists, then sometimes they are, the wait lists are so long that if they could start something on their own first, start the work and then kind of bring that when they finally come off the wait list and say, Hey, here's what I've been doing so far. Yeah. You know, yeah. That can make a difference. And I'm a big, I'm a big believer in like starting where you are. Uh, and I, and I know a lot of times there's barriers, not just with mental health, but in life period. And sometimes, you know, we allow our barriers to stop us from moving forward. Uh, so, I, you know, with the self-guided course, it kind of prevents the barrier um, where you can literally like start where you are. Wow. And so when did you, when did you start um, that, that self-guided program? When was that first available? So, so I started working on it actually uh, the beginning of 2020 and I started it in September of 2020. Uh, so I, I put a lot of, uh, I did a lot of testers, uh, so worked with some people to just see how it would work, and that way I can get an idea from like the person on the other side. Uh, so uh, now you're in 2021, it's actually it works out smoothly because of all the testing I did with it. <laughs> No, oh, that's great. I mean, I think that people really appreciate having um, resources that they can use at home. And as you mentioned, for a variety of reasons, sometimes people are, they're maybe not ready to go talk to someone. Um, and sometimes those matters can be, just feel very intimate. And to kind of start that process at home, you can get a far way. Um, and a lot of times you think, well, you have to talk to a therapist, you have to do this. And sometimes maybe you're right, you could start doing some things on your own. And that's the benefit of having the internet, <laughs> you know, yeah. having these programs. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why. So awesome. Um, and then there's another class that's called All About Love. Tell us a little bit about that one. So not only do people struggle with the inner child, people also struggle with love and uh, I think there's this misconception on what love is. I think we are looking more at it as a feeling. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, like the media does a disservice to us uh, where we see someone like fall in love and um, meet that special someone and they live happily ever after uh, when in life it doesn't work that way. Uh, so because of that, I created this course that really guides people into understanding the way they were taught to love and how they can actually start to love themselves and others. Wow. Wow. And so is that also self-guided? So that one, so both of these are called master classes. Um, and uh, so the first one is healing the inner child and the other one is called all about love. And um, uh, I guess, is it um, also like a self-guided kind of thing or is it something that, yeah. Yeah, so there, I don't have Healing the Inner Child, but um, from people watching, there's a book called All About Love. I literally, um, in another book called Healing the Inner Child, I literally uh, used the book and created lesson plans. So each lesson is like 10 minutes of me talking about it along with homework assignment. And so people have access to it for a year, so they don't have to feel rushed. So they listen to the lesson, it coincides with the chapter. And then they kind of do their homework assignment, which has to do with them observ observing themselves or taking inventory of their history. Um, and then they come back to lesson two. So there's about 10 lessons in each uh, course. Oh, I think that's such a remarkable idea. Because think about it, you know, uh, people put this time to, to, into writing books and to have someone with training as a therapist to then help you dissect the book create ways to reflect on it in a way that could help you. I mean, that is, I think it's a, rev, a, a kind of a revolutionary idea, but I also think it's so useful because I think that's what people would hope for is to have someone that can say, well, this book is really good, but I wonder if we can use this resource um, and put it in a form where people can kind of like reflect on it. Um, people, people should hire you to kind of like convert their books into like work, work, you know, you know how they create like a, the, um, the kind of companion workbook to, yeah. <laughs> Harry, this took a long time and initially it started off where it was going to be like a book club where we read a self-help book every month. And I recognize I would get excited about it, but it was some heavy stuff in this, yeah. in this book. <laughs> and so I'm like, what are the two staples? And I'm like, love and trauma. And, um. And so that's how I came up with that. But I mean, when I look at it, sometimes I'll go through the lessons and I'm like, I can't believe this is me doing this. 
but it did I put a lot of like sweat into it that's why <laughs> yeah and it's the kind of thing that people can kind of um even use it maybe to do groups you know in the future they can they can use some of those steps some of those principles and like have just a little group in their own community they can say hey you know did you let's let's all go through this thing together let's go to this website let's all do this master class together with this group so so listeners out there that may be interested in doing something like that here are some resources that you can use to even start your own group a little mini group in your uh in your community to kind of go through and and kind of heal together even you know a great idea dr yeah. Kerry. i didn't yeah. think about that Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, one of the things that we realize that in our community, particularly in the black community, there's just so much p strength in being together. There's just so much power in community. And there's definitely you can do things on your own. And that's totally okay, too. Uh, sometimes there's just power in having that person with you, particularly with somebody you trust to kind of share something with and go through a resource together. So yeah. no, for those that are interested. <laughs> oh. so your website is called shifting the way you think um and tell us a little bit about um i guess even how you came up with that title of shifting the way you think and what your philosophy is yeah so i have um so i have celeste therapist which is a podcast um and it has its own site and so from the podcast uh i recognized that i was actually helping people shift their thought process uh, because of how we get stuck. And so uh, for, for people listening, I have uh, this, uh, what is it called? Branding for shifting the way you think. And inside of it, there are, um, the picture is my daughter, but inside of it, there are these wheels that look like they're turning. Uh, and the first wheel says understand. So we got to understand what it is that we're dealing with. And a lot of times it's faulty narratives. And so the next wheel says reframe. So as we're understanding what we're the faulty narratives we got to work on reframing it that's where the affirmations come in and then after that we have to take action how do i take action in changing uh you know the things that i may have been doing or the faulty narratives that i may have thought was my life and learning that i can do things differently so after we take action we got to be consistent that's the next will and then the next will says repeat. So this process happens, the reframing. I'm always understanding and reframing. It's not like I, I've arrived at a place and I've never done it. And then the last will says we heal. So as we're able to do that, we start to heal. So when it comes to shifting the way you think, this is kind of the philosophy behind it. Wow, that's pretty cool. So they're looking at faulty narratives, reframing, understanding, affirmations, action, consistency, um, and repeating it, kind of go, doing this process over and over, which would lead to uh, kind of a healing um, kind of process. I think that's um, amazing. And I imagine that on your podcast, that's, you know, something that you kind of talk about in a lot of different dimensions, like helping people to realize, like, what are the narratives that we tell ourselves that can hold us back or um, can, you know, lead us to have certain intense emotions or certain kinds of issues going on? Um, so I guess I wonder at what point did you kind of shift from wanting to like just help people in a, a clinic or in a kind of an individual kind of um, way to then saying, you know what, I think I want to do a podcast. I want to actually help more people and share the thoughts that I, the, the philosophies that I have. Like, how did you make that transition? Yeah, that's think that was that's a good question. Uh, Cause you know, some people say like, you know, I always wanted a podcast or I always wanted to be an author. I always wanted to be on social media. That was never me. <laughs> uh, I literally, I had an office in Roxbury and um, I was also working in um, the emergency room in three different emergency rooms in Boston. And I remember when I started uh, in the emergency room, I walked into a room with a, a black male who was like excited that I was there and he was struggling with some uh, symptoms uh, because he had been sober for a month, but had used for 15 years. And he was having a lot of anxiety symptoms. And so I, for me, mental health is like ABC, you know, it's so easy for me to like think about and talk about. When I talked to him about it, the way he lit up and understood like, wow, I probably started drinking because I was struggling with the anxiety. And the reason why I feel it now is because the anxiety never went away, right? Like it was masked with the alcohol. And so just that 45 minute dialogue for one person, I thought to myself, like, how many more people are like him that don't understand mental health and they're struggling in silence? So I started just going on social media, reposting positive quotes and um, going on YouTube and just like 
uh, talking about mental health. Then someone told me about Periscope. And then I would come on five days a week with a little lesson plan that was like 20 minutes. On Fridays, people would ask me about mental health. And then um, I recognized that like social media is disposable. Like my account could be swiped away at any point. Uh, so in 2018, I decided I was going to create the podcast. So literally every everything that I've done, even from the podcast with the guided journal, it was from people asking questions about how do I start to understand what I'm thinking? Like, how do I make that pause? And I would talk to them about writing and asking themselves questions. And so uh, the journal was derived from that um, process. <clears throat> so literally every step of the way has happened because I've always been in action mode. Um, and I and I know for people listening, the more that you are doing things in alignment with your purpose, the more ideas come, you know, and n at no step of the way was it ever easy. Uh, but because I understand my purpose and because I, I keep going, the the uh, thoughts and the ideas just come flowing. Like I credit, I definitely credit that to God. <laughs> No, I, I love what you said about kind of being in alignment with your purpose. I think a lot of people struggle with thinking through what their purpose is. And, you know, one of the things that you also said was kind of this, this idea of just keep moving, keep going. Um, you know, for some people, they kind of know really early on, they're like, as you were like, I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to have a podcast. I always wanted to be an author. And they kind of know that. And for some people, it kind of happens gradually. Like they start moving one step at a time. Like, okay, what's the next kind of uh, brick that I need to step on? Okay, I'm sure it's this one. Let's go there next. And as you do it, the things kind of unfold a little bit. Your purpose kind of unfolds a little bit at a time. Um, and uh, I, you know, I imagine that with self-reflection, right, with some guided self-reflection questions, some sometimes that can help too with helping people to uncover their purpose, but also to kind of think through um, the, kind of the meaning they get out of their life and and all of that, and, and that can bring joy, that can bring peace. Um, but that's, I think, I like that idea of uh, kind of aligning with your purpose because that's when things feel right. And it also allows the motivation. I, I, you know, I hear a lot of people say where. I don't have the motivation and there were days that I weren't, I was not motivated. I was fearful, but I didn't let the fear stop me. Also the motivation doesn't just ma magically appear, right? I think the more that we do things, the more motivation we have. And so um, if you have a plan, if you're in action mode, if you're consistent, um, you're going to find yourself in a cycle of motivation. There won't always be good days, but there won't always be bad days either. Right. Right. I, 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 exactly. If you are, if you can kind of keep going, even when the days are not great, just kind of push through those days. And um, it kind of makes me think of something that someone had said to me once when I was in a place in my kind of medical training where there's like a, a branch point where you start your medical training and then they say, okay, what area of medicine do you want to specialize in? Um, and there's like all these different areas. And they said, here's some of the kinds of things you can think about to help guide that decision. And one of the questions that stood out to me the most was what kinds of problems do you like to solve? Because a lot of times people think about, oh, what makes me happy and what do I like to do and what makes me excited? But that question, what kind of problems would I like to solve? For me was the key about, well, what happens in the bad days? What happens in the days where there's some complex cases or you're not sure what to do next? And I think, oh, for me, that was psychiatric medicine. Those were the kind of problems I wanted to solve. And, and now that's what I do is kind of help to solve complex problems in psychiatric medicine. Um, and that's why even on the bad days, I can still sit back and reflect and say, you know, even though this isn't easy, I'm still motivated to do it because these are the kinds of problems I like to solve. So I, I share that with you guys as listeners that that can be a question you can ask yourself when you're thinking through like, what do you want to do is, you know, what, what, what kinds of complex situations would you think, okay, I'd be okay being in this situation. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So now I, um, I, I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about what it was, uh, I guess, like for you to like write the books that you wrote. So one is a journal and one is on relationship, um, building or relationship, um, goals. And I wanted to know what it was like for you to kind of like write that, how you felt about doing it, um, and just that process of kind of getting that out there. Yeah, you know, I have so much respect for authors. I just want to say that because I'm an author, but I'm not an author because uh, 
So for the guided journal, uh, like I said earlier, I would put these quotes up on uh, on Instagram and social media uh, that I would find on Pinterest. But then I would write a little blurb about it underneath of the of the post. And um, from you know, it, it was one day I had about 370 posts on my Instagram story, um, and I heard uh, someone talk about writing a journal, and it was their book. And um, I'm doing these live Periscope uh, segments where I'm talking about journaling. And then it all came together. All I did, I said, oh, well, you know, I want people to be intentional. That was always my keyword uh, and, and 365 days a year. So uh, what I, when I looked at that number, 367, I'm like, oh, 365, I have my book right here. So my guided journal is literally me asking you different questions um, throughout the year. Um, and for six months, there's a set of questions. And then the next six months we restart from day one. So you can see your growth. Everything that I do is because I want people to celebrate their growth and celebrate their moments. Um, and so the guided journal allows that to happen. So that's kind of, uh, the guided journal and how it was created. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I'm asking in the journal every day is how are you feeling? I believe that today. I, I believe that's a staple. That should be a staple in our own individual lives to ask ourselves how we're feeling because a lot of the things that we do or not do are based off of feelings, unfortunately. Um, so I, 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 that's the way that book came about. <laughs> um, so the relationship goals, uh, it's the guide to a healthy relationship. So when I did these segments, Fridays, I would ask people, they can ask me about mental health, but Thursdays, I would talk about relationships. And so people would ask me questions about relationships. And it was always my hottest live stream. Um, even now, when I talk about relationships on my podcast, it's always my live stream, the hottest one. And uh, I always would see people write relationship goals, like under a picture. And I'm like, people really have like this misconception on what relationship goals really means. It's not about a picture. It's bigger than a picture. It's about understanding who you are. It's about understanding what you come to the table with. Um, what is it that you really want, right? And then how to continue to build a foundation where it's not uh, toppling over. So uh, I created a really small guide and that guide was based off of when I would do these segments, um, I just kind of put it together and um, the material was there. I just had to put it together because I had already been doing these live streams. But before the live streams, I would write these common qu questions or common issues, and then I would write the solution. So literally within the book, there's um, the questions and the solution right there for people. Um, and it's eight small chapters. Um, so, you know, when I, my, again, my hat goes off, out, off to authors because I literally, um, I mean, authors put in a lot of work into their stuff. I mean, I put in a lot of work, but it wasn't because of the book, but it just happened to work out that way. <laughs> oh, no, that's amazing. I think it's, um, and to be able to summarize information in one place so people can look at it is helpful to us as well. Um, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we'll, you know, still kind of watch things and like listen to the podcast and that kind of thing. But actually I've seen a lot of, um, a lot of folks, a lot of even kind of like a celebrity speakers and so on, um, even um, pastors, they'll repackage their sermons into a book. And sometimes I'll read the book and I'm like, I just heard you say this in a sermon like two weeks ago or whatever, you know? And it's like, it's, but what it is, is, is that it's not that it's like, a, it's not, it's just kind of repackaging the material, but it's, um, it's summarizing it. So now I, I kind of have it whenever I need to, I can just reread it. Um, it's, it's kind of easy to, to access. You can read it on a plane or whatever. Um, so I think it's helpful for people to have it in that format. I think it is. So. Yeah, you know, so many people learn different ways. Uh, you know, for me, I'm, my learning style is reading, hearing, and writing. You know, so I always think about different ways and people, the way people learn. Um, so I try to put out a lot of different material that can reach people in different capacities. Oh, oh that's pretty cool. I, I like um, what you said about the journal and the idea of celebrating growth. Um, you know, a lot of us, particularly, I, I don't know, I feel like we live in a culture sometimes where we focus so much on trying to get better, trying to get better, trying to get better, that sometimes this idea of stopping to say, look at how far I've come, um, it's, it's difficult. Um, and, you know, even as a, 
as a as a, a kind of a therapist, a psychiatrist, um, it's one of the challenging things sometimes to do with clients is to help them to see how far they've come because sometimes they can only see um, the things that they haven't accomplished yet. So the idea of creating a, a, a way for people to reflect and celebrate their growth, I think is really important. And then also you mentioned kind of focusing on that question, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Um, I've seen people that just have such difficulty even identifying how they're feeling, right? So we think, okay, you know, part of the reason some people don't like being asked that question is because they're not sure what the answer is, or, you know, they, they may be, um, their feelings feel very intense and they're not sure what to say. And so having a journal like this where you have to like make it a, a habit to kind of reflect on and describe it gives you kind of a new skill. Yeah. gives you a new skill to be able to kind of be in touch with your feelings and to describe your feelings in a way that other people can understand and even provide support if needed. Yeah, and also I think people struggle with identifying it because it can be feel vulnerable, especially in the Black community. Um, we're told to be strong, and I use that lightly in quotation marks because I believe being strong is not just recognizing the good times but the hard times because we – are humans, right? We're gonna we're gonna feel, and we've associated vulnerability with negativity when, in fact, that's who we are. And so, a lot of times, people have said, you know, well, what's the point in saying like how I feel when I can't do anything about it? The reality is, is that if you're not acknowledging what's happening to you, your mind is is going off of that, right? Whether you want to admit it or not, your body keeps the score. And it's important for people to understand that you may not, I may not be able to do nothing in the moment right now if I'm feeling sad, but guess what? I can actually work on a plan. What can I do? And I think that a lot of times where you are in life, where you may be uncomfortable or not where you want to be, a lot of it is because your mind is running the show. So it's important to be a part of your mind because it's going to keep going with or without your permission. So for me, I'm like, i will rather be a part of the process as opposed to allowing the process to happen without me. Uh, so you put, you kind of are in a position where you can be intentional. You can actually act versus just reacting and being passive and letting things happen. Exactly. And, and obviously, like, you know, for we, we never was, were taught that way, you know, like for me, it was partying, it was drinking, it was in school. School was a coping mechanism. When school was over, I had to really sit with myself because there was no more school, no more homework. And, um, and we're used to surviving. We survive really well. Black people are really great survivors, but we're not great livers because we never had the tools. We never had the education around it. And, you know, I think because of how much I've grown from learning how to live life, it makes me extremely passionate to share with others so they can see that there's another way to live life. And we don't have to just survive through life all the time. Oh, amazing. And so for those of you that are just joining, you're listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. I'm a psychiatrist here in Massachusetts. And my guest today is Celeste the Therapist, um, Celeste Vissier, uh, who is a podcast host and an author. And today we're talking about just, you know, her work and um, her podcast and her books and um, her website, Shifting the Way You Think, Shifting the Way You Think. So you can ch uh, check out that website. If you have any questions, you can call us at 617-238-7111. That's 617-238-7111. Seven two three eight seven one eleven. You can also follow the live stream on Facebook. That Facebook page is heat nine eight one FM dot com. So heat nine eight one FM dot com to just follow the live stream. Even if you just want to see our faces, drop a comment, say hello. Um, so. You know, there are a lot of, I was kind of reading through your journal, um, Celeste, and it, it found that there were a lot of kind of different themes that I thought were really great. I mean, you cover, as you mentioned, like personal growth, touching on things like the importance of forgiveness. You also touch on um, having a vision and being intentional about your life. Again, relationships and boundaries and healing. Um, and I wanted you to kind of talk about something. So in the cover flap of your journal, there's this quote that I'm going to read your, the quote from your book. And it says, in order to remain healthy and whole in life, it is important for us to remain conscious of how we are affected by life circumstances. All of our actions are shaped by how we feel and how we feel is directly influenced by how we think. If we intentionally process our thoughts on a daily basis, we will begin to understand where our feelings derive from, as well as grow in our ability to make mindful decisions. 
Can you say a little bit more about that? Was like a really great summary. Can you say a little bit more about that kind of philosophy? You made it sound so good. I was like, can't believe me. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, like I just talked about us being survivors, um, taking time to pause and, and thinking about what's happening. It doesn't change anything, but it doesn't c carry with us in a negative way. You know, I think even from childhood growing up, traumatic things happen. We try to like put kids in different things and not talk about it. Let's not talk about it, especially in the black community. We're really big on not talking about it. And um, it does something to our system. You know, it paralyzes us in many ways with our purpose, with our growth. Um, and so everything is connected, right? Our feelings, our thoughts and our action. And I think if I can just stop and think, there's, you know, I say there's a lot of people in jail today that um, have done things because of how they were feeling. And now they have time to think about it. They would do it differently. Right. And so instead of us like reacting to certain things, what if we actually were able to learn how to pause and process what's happening so that our decision making can look differently? Um, and, you know, I think it's not just the black thing. I think it's an American thing. America only talks about success in a way of like uh, close relationships and what you have. And so everyone's kind of chasing this like dream and losing themselves in the process. I always say like, I don't want to have like money and fame and, and inside I'm lost or inside I don't have peace. Like I want it to go together, but it never goes together because we're always running. It's like, where, where are you going? You know, like, you know, what do you, where are you running to? We only have the moment. And because we only have the moment, most people don't live in the moment. So most people struggle a lot with feeling anxious or feeling depressed or feeling overwhelmed because they're not in the moment. Um, and, and I really believe that like that, what you just read about the thoughts and the action and, and the feelings, if we really start to work through them, our life looks differently, not because we hit the lottery. You know, every time I have clients, you know, and they start to make the shift, I'm like, you didn't hit the lottery. You didn't win a new house. You didn't get a new car. I was like, you just reframed your thought process. And that's, and I, this is coming from somebody who thought I would always feel depressed or thought that life was always going to feel miserable. Um, and to be where I'm at now, even talking about this, the way I talk about it, I know that this message is for everybody because I'm like a living testament of what reframing your thoughts could look like. Oh, yeah. And it, there's such power in reframing things. Um, and, and it's, um, I think that's one of the things that a therapist is helpful for is for reframing and shifting how people think about things. But then again, as you mentioned earlier, if you can find resources and books and, and things like that, that help, that can help to supplement it as well. And a journal like this will help people to self reflect, um, which brings me to this kind of idea of self reflection. You do mention that one of the common mistakes we make in society is failing to self reflect. Um, what are what do you what are your thoughts about self reflection and the different ways that people can do it? Because you know, one you mentioned is kind of like pausing to kind of think, um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your thoughts about self reflection in general. Yeah, I think self reflection. You know, there's this like wellness will with like financial, environmental. Um, it has social. It has uh, intellectual. You know, I think all areas of our lives. Um, when we can work on self-reflecting, we can feel a little bit more balanced. Um, because we're not really taught to do it, we don't really do it. A lot of times we'll feel stuff in our body before logic kicks in. And a lot of, a lot of you know, our mind, spirit, body is all connected, but somehow we've treated it differently, especially in the way we stigmatize mental health. Um, and so if we're reflecting, for me, I grew up with a lot of back issues where it was, I never had a diagnosis. They gave me muscle relaxer one time and uh, my back would hurt periodically. It wasn't until I became an adult, I recognized when I'm overwhelmed and I'm stressed out, it feels like something heavy comes over my back. Um, and then what do I do? I hunch over. But now that I'm like aware of this, as soon as I feel it, I'm, I, I pause and I'm like, okay, what's going on? I have a lot going on. And then I straighten my back up, right? So that's just one example on how if I'm reflecting on it, I'm not hurled over. A lot of mental health issues, a lot of stressors turn into medical issues, right? There are a lot of things where um, there's a high correlation to certain um, ailments because of the stressors that we don't deal with. 
And a lot of times it's just really people say like, here, take this pill or this medicine. Um, but if we really started to reflect, I think that we can really work on changing like our stress, stress levels, some of the medical issues we have um, and, and have a little bit more peace in our life. Oh, if that, if that's, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned some of that too, with the um, kind of the idea that we can have a physical manifestation of some of the things that we're holding on to um, and taking that pause to kind of say, okay, where is this coming from? What is this connected to? What else is going on in my body? What's going on in my mind at the time? You can make these connections because I, I have a kind of a similar experience where I never usually have back pain and I suddenly had very bad back pain and started to make that connection that, okay, it's, it's very infrequent. If I experience back pain, I wonder if there is something else going on that's causing me to tense my muscles. Um, and just kind of stopping to self-reflect can help you to kind of, okay, I don't probably don't need the heavy medications. I probably just need a massage or I probably need this or that or the other, something else. Um, you know, so it's, I think self-reflection can be helpful in that way. But I, I also think about um, how sometimes the systems are the most successful are systems that stop to reflect. So taking it to like an organizational level. And I think in, um, in, in uh, general medicine and in surgery, whenever there's uh, some kind of a bad outcome, there's uh, what they call m and &M. It's like a morbidity and mortality conference. And it's where they kind of talk about what went wrong. Let's stop and self-reflect on what went wrong to improve this system. And so if someone had a bad outcome, they'll say, let's present this entire patient case. Let's figure out how the system broke down and let's kind of pinpoint what we need to change differently versus just kind of moving forward um, and kind of not stopping to figure out what wrong. And I'm thinking as human beings, we need to do that for ourselves too. When something is going wrong, we need to stop and say time out. Let's kind of go back. Let's go back to the beginning, go through this whole story and say, I wonder what, at what point did things start to go wrong? Um, so self-reflection does that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And, it, you know, an analogy is if like you uh, had a, a welcome guest at your door and you um, stopped and thought and, and asked them questions. But instead, we have so many unwelcome thoughts, so many unwelcome things that are happening throughout our day and they start marinating in our system. I say you just have a bunch of people coming in your house and you're not stopping them at the door. When you reflect, you can just stop them at the door. So it's not that I don't have these negative thoughts or or I'm just uh, this like peaceful, serene person. Things happen, but now I learned how to reflect so that they're not causing me to feel debilitated or stopping me in my tracks. Yeah, yeah, wow. Um, now. I, I was kind of flipping through and I saw on day 37, it says, you are okay. Things will get better. You may not believe that right now, but it's important to speak positively over your life. Why is it important? Why, why would you say it's important for people to say out loud kind of thing, positive things over their life? Like, because some people, you know, there's a, a school of thought that, well, you know, life is real. And I'm just going to, you know, keep it real. What, when you say speak positively over your life, can you tell us a little bit more about that and the power of that? Yeah. And speaking positive doesn't deny the negative, like negative things can be happening. Sometimes when, you know, when I'm talking to my clients, I'm like, yeah, that really does suck. Right. But then we're thinking about a plan. Like, how do we move forward? We're going to acknowledge that it sucks. We're going to cry. It's going to be, we're going to be sad about it because we're human. This is reality. But then, like, how do we move forward? Um, and I think that it's so important to speak positive because we're changing the way that our brain operates. It allows us to reframe some of the ways that we're looking at a situation. Um, and when I say, like, you're not okay, like, I understand that because I remember I felt like a lot of people would give these, like, feel-good messages without acknowledging the pain where it's just, just do this and just do that. And so when I write or when I talk, I think about where I was in life and how I know what wasn't helpful for me to hear. And I think for me to acknowledge the pain helps people uh, be seen. And for you to acknowledge the pain, you're not ignoring the pain. You're, you're saying, I'm not okay, but I will be okay. And when you start to talk to yourself in, in a positive way, it actually reframes the way you're seeing life the way you're seeing things. I, I tell people when we start to create and be in an environment 
where we want to see ourselves, our mind and body has no other choice but to fall in line with what we're doing. So my brain is going to believe whatever my brain tells it. And that's why I said being a part of the process internally is important because that's where your brain is moving towards, not from logic. You can say you want to do this and do that, but if internally you don't believe it, you're not going to make any moves. And so if you start doing this consistently, then your brain's like, all right, I guess Celeste wants to be healed. I guess Celeste wants peace. I guess that's what we're doing, right? They have no other choice because now I'm the person in charge of my thoughts, not my history, not my trauma, not what somebody said, but what I'm telling myself. Now, now you talk about kind of be kind of trying to move into that place where you're like in charge of your thoughts. And I think that goes along with this idea of being intentional. I, I see so many people that just they feel kind of helpless. Like they feel like I can't I can't do this. I can't change my thoughts. Um, it just seems um, like so difficult. What are what are the things that you say to people that's that have because I, I know it's a common thing people say is that I I don't know if I can do this I don't know if I can reframe I don't know if I can change these thoughts like I just feel so bad about myself or I just feel so bad about the situation like what do you say to them? Yeah, that's hard, right? When when you um, especially if you've never seen it done, right? You don't hear people talk about it. You've never seen it in your life. Um, one thing I tell people I remind them that they go to work when they don't feel like it, um, and that they're capable to do things that that they need to do to survive. And I remind them because they haven't learned how to live, that's why it can feel hard, right? Feelings change. And so I, I think sometimes when I, sit, when I make that comparison of um, going to work when you don't feel like it because you got to pay your rent, you got to pay your bills, but not doing something because you don't feel like it or you don't feel it, that means that you're actually capable of doing it. And the task isn't literally hard to do, but, it, you know, it's like you walk over a puddle. It's, that's what it's like walking over a puddle, but it can feel like walking over the Grand Canyon, right? The feeling of it feels hard because you're fighting your system. Your system is not used to you uh, living life. Your system is only used to survive, and that's the only way it knows how to operate until you be a part of the process and teach it how to live. And so I tell people to write down what they want life to look like or what they want to happen. And so they have to put it somewhere where they can see it every single day. Mm -hmm. So that's their why, right? So if I don't feel like making reading this positive affirmation, but I have my why in front of me, I'm going to do it because I know that's what's going to lead up to it. And the last thing I always say is like, you know, if what you're doing right now is not working, why not try something else? Like, what do you have to lose? We don't have anything to lose. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Like, why not? Like, why, why not try this? You know? Um, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about like the, like p positive coping strategies and, um, and positive kind of affirmations. And I thought it would be kind of interesting if, um, each of us could maybe come up with three positive affirmations for ourselves, or uh, three positive things about ourselves. Cause that was one of the journal reflections is to say three positive things about yourself. Um, and for the listeners that are listening, I would challenge you also to right now think about three positive things about your, that you can say about yourself. Um, and in the meanwhile, I also want us to talk about just coping strategies as well. So I guess, I don't know if you want to go first, three positive things about yourself um, that if you were doing that journal kind of uh, day, what would you say about yourself? Uh, I, am, <laughs> I am a great mom. Um, I, um, uh, I love myself. Um, I'm a great mom. I love myself. And another positive thing about me is that um, I am a great listener. <laughs> so I'm going to take one of the things that you said. <clears throat> I'm going to say I, I, I am a good listener. Um, and I will say I am, uh, I very easily feel motivated to do um, new things. I enjoy doing new things and, and trying new things and, and all of that. And um, I, uh, hmm, that'll be the third positive thing. Um, I'm, I'm, 
I'm not, I'm not a bad cook. I, I, maybe that's a half positive thing because I'm not a great, 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 like wonderful chef, but, but I'm pretty good at, at combining flavors. So I got that Caribbean kind of seasoning thing going. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at cooking. So that's my positive, my positive thing. So for those that are listening, um, you know, uh, you can even drop your positive comments in the Facebook live feed, uh, heat981fm.com. Let me know at least one positive thing to say about yourself. Drop it in the comments, heat981fm.com. Um, you guys are listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams, and my guest today is Celeste, the therapist. If you want to call in, the phone number here is 617-238-7111. So I guess the other thing was the coping strategies for dealing with negative feelings. And there's such a variety of things that people can do. What are maybe like a few simple things that people can do when they're starting to have negative feelings that can maybe kind of lift them out of that? Yeah, I can share what I do. So for me, um, I look at my routine as like my medicine for living, right? I always try to like make things tangible for people uh, because when my head hurts, it will pop, pop a Tylenol really quick. Um, so I really want people to think about this in that way. Um, I listen to like YouTube motivational videos all the time. Uh, my favorite is Alan Watts and Les Brown. Um, and whether I'm feeling good or not, I still listen to it um, so that it can feel so it's marinating in my spirit and, and engaging in my day to day. There are days where I feel like um, I feel really low. Um, and then on those days, like I will make sure I'm listening to it a little bit longer. I move my body every single day, whether I'm walking around my block or I'm in the woods, um, that's something. Um, I'm big on writing, right? So if I'm overwhelmed or have a lot going on, I'll write, I'll write how I'm feeling. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about these, you know, these three things that I'm talking about I do doesn't cost any money. I'm big on um, not looking at self-care or looking at uh, reframing those thoughts in a way where you have to pay for money or there's barriers. There's no barriers to working on changing the way your system works. Um, it's really a lot of action and kind of fighting your, your own, like, I don't feel like it, you know, like, I don't feel like getting up in the morning sometime to like start my day earlier, but I know that I need it because it gives me the fuel I need for the rest of the day. So like, People that are diabetics will take their insulin whether or not they feel like it because they got to survive. I really want you to start thinking about how do I feed my spirit every day? Like, what have I done every day? Do I always do something every day? No, there's days where I've missed the mark, but it's not a consistent thing because at this stage in my life, my system like yearns for it. It yearns for that walk in the nature. Um, <laughs> it wakes me up in the morning when the sun comes out. So when you're hungry, you go to the refrigerator and eat. When your spirit's hungry, I want you to think about what did I do to feed my spirit? I really want you to try to think about it in that way to help yourself push past that feeling. Oh, I, I, um, I, I like that thought. And, I, you know, so I like the idea of listening to motivational videos because I think that can be so uplifting. So that tip I'll take with me and, I'll, you know, listeners just to kind of reiterate that listening to motivational or watching motivational videos on YouTube or things like that, your favorite motivational speakers, um, and then moving your body. Yeah, every day. Um, I think um, our Facebook um, listeners are saying, you know, body in motion stays in motion. Um, and a couple of positive comments here. I'm a true friend. I try very hard and always bring positive vibes and I love life. Um, and, um, I'm following through with my goals. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, I think, I think it's so important to kind of think through and encourage ourselves and to know, yeah, you know what? It's not always going to be easy. There's a lot of things to worry about. There's a lot of things to kind of, you know, do, but to pause and say, Hmm, let's talk about something positive <laughs> for a change and let's try to work on that, you know? <laughs> and I want you to say, you know, one of the things I always say to my clients, are you proud of yourself? And that, you know, anytime I accomplish something, like, oh my God, I'm so proud of myself. Like I'm really my biggest motivator because I can't wait for somebody else to do it for me, yeah. you know? So yeah. people that may not have motivators in their life, um, never had, be your biggest cheerleader. Remind yourself that I'm proud of myself. Uh, when you accomplish just getting up out of bed, sometimes it's literally just making up your bed in the morning. I don't care if it's not a big deal for somebody else. If, for you, if that's a big deal, then that's a big deal, right? And so if I'm constantly comparing myself to who I was yesterday, 
I'm not going to find myself feeling like I'm comparing myself to someone else because I'm only looking at where I was yesterday. Um, so definitely think about that so you can work on being proud of yourself. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The idea of being proud of oneself. There's, I feel like there's just, you know, growing up and through adulthood, there is so, there's so much negativity that we can encounter. A lot of people that say, well, you didn't get accepted to this job or you didn't get accepted to the school, or we have to let you go from this job, or here's your performance review. Here's all the things you're doing. Um, not that you're not doing well. And this idea of being able to again, celebrate, here's what I am doing well. And, and, and I am proud of myself for taking this step. I think that's so powerful to say, it doesn't matter what all these other people say. I know that this is an achievement and that this is growth. Um, and it kind of brings me to this, uh, something that I, I had met, said to you before, like it kind of stood out to me a lot. It's from your journal. It said, did you know, did you know that there is room in life for everyone to win? Everything is not a competition we can all bloom together. So I'll say that again. Did you know that there is room in life for everyone to win? Everything is not a competition. We can all bloom together. And this idea that, you know, there, um, this, the, the, the comparisons can sometimes hold us back. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I think as a black woman, um, you know, unfortunately, like I've gotten a lot of, um, um, and a lot of other black women in the nonprofit world, in, my, in the work career that I've had, um, have shut me down. And, um, and I, re I realized it's like, it felt, it may have felt like competition. Um, cause you know, I've always been in school. I've always had a degree. Um, and so, but it made me sad because I'm such a, like, I'm such a likable person and I love people and I love, um, other black women a lot. So, um, when that happened, it de definitely like, I, it took me for a loop. It happened a few times. Um, and so like, I just, I just want people to get secure in themselves and what they're doing um, because there's so many different ways that we can all bloom. You know, I look at a bouquet of flowers. They're all beautiful together. Um, but if I'm still trying to be like a, the flower next to me, I'm not going to be able to experience the beauty of the bouquet. So, and that's like life, right? I think that there's a lane for everyone um, if we really just start to look at, you know, where we were yesterday like I just said earlier, I think that um, people wouldn't feel so, they wouldn't struggle with insecurity or feel a, a, a need to kind of compete or knock anybody down um, because it just doesn't make any sense when they're, we can all win together. Yeah. There's sometimes this false notion that if someone else wins, that means that I lose. And, and it's just like, I don't know where we get this from. Like if someone else achieves something, then suddenly it means that like there's something I've, it's some kind of loss for me and that it's not true. It doesn't make sense. Like that person can achieve something and that's fine. That's their way. That's something that they've achieved. It doesn't say anything about, you know, about other people <laughs> necessarily, you know? So it's this idea that, um, you know, if someone else does something like, for example, if you write a book, that means I can't write a book or something like that. This kind of feeling that there's like not enough room for everyone to breathe. Um, it's a, it's uh it's not true. It's not true. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell people there to go down the bread aisle. If you ever feel like, oh, this podcast is already out or this blah, blah, blah is already out. Go to the grocery store and go down the bread aisle and count how many different breads there are. And, and so you can snap yourself into reality, just like the TV shows. And there's TV shows that come out all the time. No one says, but there's already this TV show out, right? So, uh, you know, try not to think about it in that way because there's room for all of us. <laughs> That's so true, true. Like you mentioned the TV show thing. I was thinking there's so many um, movies and shows that have almost the exact same kind of like base plot line where like boy meets girl, they fall in love, but then there's like a perceived betrayal. And so they come up, you know, fall apart. And then by the end of the movie, they get back together. That right. theme is like <laughs> in so many movies and we watch all of them. Right. So <laughs> they, they haven't really given up. There's room for all of those movies. Well, yeah. I want to thank you so much, Celeste, for coming on the show today. I can't believe the time has gone by like so quickly. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, what, where can people uh, find you just to kind of, uh, here at the end, like if people want to connect with you or listen to your podcast, like where can they find you? So thank you for having me. This was awesome. The time went by quickly because we talked about so many great things. Uh, go to celestetherapist.com and you can find me on social media, uh, by searching Celeste Therapist. 
All right. Awesome. Awesome. So, and uh, for you listeners, thank you so much for joining us for Black Mental Health Matters. Again, I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. My guest today was Celeste Vissier or Celeste the Therapist. Check out her podcast, check out her books, check out her um, programs, self-guided programs. You guys are not going to regret it. So, um, I'll see you again next week um, here every Sunday at 1 p.m. on 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. So have a great week. Hi, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show today. If you want to see more on Black Mental Health Matters, you can go to my website, drcarianne.net. There you can find past radio shows, past guests, and other information. Follow me on YouTube, and you can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Carianne. So hope to check in with you again next week. 